Welcome to the EMT Pro Podcast, where we deliver relevant EMS content from the field in the classroom each month. Episodes of this podcast can get you one full hour of CE through our partner, emt-ce.com, so head over there for more information. I'm your host, Steve Williams, and with me today is Dan and Holly and a special guest that we'll introduce here in a second. Guys, welcome. Hello, Steve. How are you? Well, how are you? Good. Good. We've got um, a really special person uh, in person with us today. I know. And I'm excited to introduce him to our little EMS world. Um, How many people want to drive all the way down here? No. I mean, no. I don't. I know. And yet you keep doing it. <laughs> keep you know. doing it. It's for that cup of coffee. It's, a, <laughs> it's an expensive cup of coffee. <laughs> yes. Um, but I uh, want to introduce Bruce to the world, Bruce Opsel. He is a 13-year paramedic, yeah. uh, works for a fire department up in the Portland, Oregon area, and uh, department transports. They have yes. a transport uh, unit as well, and they... How many calls are you guys running roughly a year? Mm. Is it 60? 60, 60,000? Yeah. You hit 60? Uh, I never count. Yeah. <laughs> Same with alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah. Oh, but um, we run enough to, uh, let's see, for the ambulances, I'd say like I usually am transporting anywhere from four to six patients Okay. Uh, when I've been staffed on ambulances. Uh-huh. And you're probably doing how many refusals as well? I'm really. I have a good turf game. Yeah. Um, Where you and I grew up is it's a. Yeah. They they in, ingrain that in you very well. Those pink forms are your friend. That's right. Which they don't yeah. exist anymore. But. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Sign the pink <laughs> form. Yeah. 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 Usually, when I get in arguments with people about refusal stuff, I would just be like, "Have you read the document?" <laughs> and then, no. All right. Well, maybe you should read it. Yeah. 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 But anyways. Um. Well, we're going to talk about probably our favorite topic in general, and it has to do with airway management. And Bruce is doing some really cool stuff that I'm excited for him to bring to our podcast on delivering effective ventilations um, and really everything that goes along with good airway management. Um, And I'm excited for him to talk about his tools and tips and tricks. And Bruce, we're just going to as you're kind of going, we're just going to interrupt you with questions and yeah, have you answer something that's on our brains for the different types of listeners we have, and we'll just kind of go from there. But where do you want to start? Man, um, I think uh, I always start with just the objective, and uh, for your listeners, all levels, uh, I mm-hmm. prefer to teach down to the layperson. And so uh, if you guys want to ask uh say more higher certification level questions i'll try my hardest to continue to bring it down or at least that's what i've been doing the last five or six years yeah um my grandma has been very supportive of my uh, journey i teach most of it to her first and then really yeah that's a yeah awesome. well, she she just like chooses to listen <laughs> <laughs> she loves and she has a she better intubation you. success rate than any of us she's good with follow-up <laughs> questions and that's how i was, that's because, you know, at What's some point, a BVM? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She never asked that. So I don't know where, I don't know where we're truly at. But uh, most Bruce things have been floated through grandma first. And that's been helpful in, say, teaching someone that we've recently hired that has a month of EMT basic experience. Yeah. And so it's been right helpful. On. What's your yeah. grandma's name? Jean. Jean. Grandma yeah. Jean. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Grandma Jean. That's grandma Jean. What would Grandma Jean do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. She'll probably listen to this too. So you can get another Hi, viewer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. She's she's now Put our grandma. Tally yeah. Mark. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. up to seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, administering effective ventilations uh, at all levels. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it, man. Yeah. I'm excited. <clears throat> so Bruce, I'm going to I remember the first time you, you came to our fire station. Yes. Uh, with this concept. Um and we were blown away, but very skeptical, right? And you still probably get skeptics. Yes. Um, I think uh, with it, uh, every, everybody, for some reason, once they've been trained once, they suddenly, they're like a 16-year-old driver. I'm a good driver. They say that. Mm-hmm. You ever heard? Oh, they yeah. always say it. Yep. And so it's just, it's assumed that you're just good at airway because you've maybe done it once or twice. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, I thought that, and 
it wasn't until I attended a difficulty airway course that um, I started looking at it a little bit differently, learning how to be a better at bagging mm -hmm. through a mask. Um, I tried to teach it uh, with the first department that I was with, but I felt like I needed more time and understanding. But as I transitioned to a bigger department, started working with Dan, um, I kind of pushed it aside to get through my year of probation. But then once I had an assignment and I was with a crew, I thought a way to maybe get people to be open to changing that they're good at airway like they think is to just be ventilated. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how we did it. Um, one thing that I had learned in the difficulty airway course or with Scott Weingart's EMT crit podcast was that you can use and title on a mask, which I thought you, I didn't know you could do that. And so how I could show that someone was not ventilating was to have the end title on and let them ventilate me. And I'd let them do their technique and then I'd show them a different technique, which we'll discuss. Um, but that was received well by the crew and there was a individual that was working with, with Dan at their station and wanted me to bring it to their station. So I got to show it to Dan's crew, which was, it was like nine people. It was a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It was like a 30 minute class, but I let everyone ventilate me. And, um, it was painful. Yeah. Being ventilated is uh, not, I, I didn't realize like what positive pressure does on your lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I learned over time for your listeners, if you're going to try to influence change using this, to be very careful um, and maybe, maybe just breathe if it feels right. But mm -hmm. I would get pleurisy. I'd have like back and chest pain in weird spots from that positive pressure accessing new mm -hmm. areas of the lungs. Uh, I'd burp when I was talking back to people. It was also <laughs> really funny. Uh, also very effective in proving that they did ventilate my stomach. Um, and uh, I also just was really tired. I didn't realize what a toll it would take. Like nine people, that was kind of my cutoff. But then it just kept, I kept getting more requests to come do this training. Um, I was keeping a tally of how many people were ventilating me. Mm -hmm. I called it the 6B Club, Be Better Bagging. By bagging Bruce, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had hit like seventy six, and I just keep. I was like, I'm gonna get the whole district, and um, and uh, someone from training that's a friend learned of this, and they said stop, and they gave me a, a more formal training role where I got to really explore the space, and I think I had gotten enough buy in that I didn't have to go through that anymore. Um, I still have everyone that's been with TVFR in the last like five years has at least opened my airway, but I stopped doing the that process of ventilations. But you know, the question that you just put in my brain that I've never asked myself is, I wonder how comfortable this is for the person receiving it. Right. I've yeah. I've always you know done the slow ventilations that we're taught and everything like that. Like that's ingrained in me, but I've never thought about the comfort level of receiving those ventilations and that completely changed my perspective in the last five minutes. Yeah. Um, it has me too. Mm -hmm. Um, cause there's things that I thought were pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Like maybe we're hyperventilating people or we're putting too much volume in. And so hold the, the back third of the bag or collapse it inwards, or let's mm -hmm. just get peed bags. And I'd lay there getting suffocated by those people that had that thought like I had. Uh -huh. And so, um, as I will discuss in further, uh, I like ventilating with a process, but um, I really squeeze that bag. When I'm confident that I'm in, mm -hmm. I'm sending volume. And uh, I'll sometimes bag with two hands. It's not maybe a preferred or accepted method everywhere. They want you being really careful, not inflating the stomach. But when you know, you know. And, man, it feels good when mm -hmm. you get a full when breath. When you get the full breath. Mm -hmm. when you, yeah. 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 I mean, when you think about it, just from a common sense side, like, if you go on an anxiety patient, do you calm them down by having them breathe more rapidly with lesser volume? Mm -hmm. Or is it trying to slow them down yeah. and have uh, have nice, deep, slow, controlled breaths? And I think that applies in the cardiac arrest state as well, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean. When anyways. you were um, having people bag you, did you notice, well, you know, like they say bag to the rise and fall of the chest? Um, yeah, that's my that true? Still? That's my saving grace because mm -hmm. 
we have we have new new ideas or new methods coming in, um, new new BVMs that are smaller and um, this is very much a two steps backwards like a class today or that we're going to discuss is, you know, uh, from like a system, we need to ensure that our providers are opening the airway and delivering volume to chest rise and fall. Mm -hmm. And I'd hate for us to not have the equipment capable of doing that because in instead of focusing on the two steps backwards, which is opening the airway and having a process, we keep inventing new gadgets to complement our poor techniques. Mm. Um, you know, and so, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to expand on that and further, but I'll also quickly say, just um, as we get started, that I have learned that there's no, there's just no right way to ventilate uh, any one person. And I continue to burn myself when I decide on a method before I've arrived on scene. Mm -hmm. And so there are people, even probably, uh, where you're, where we're all working, where I just eye gel. It's fast and it's easy, yep. and we're moving forward. Or I won't ventilate without OPAs and NPAs. And and I, uh, I had this like really, I had this burning question: Why are we OPA NPAing every patient? They called it the super plug. Just put all that in before mm -hmm. you even get started. And that I questioned a lot of that when I was like, why isn't the OR? When I did my clinicals, mm -hmm. I they didn't use it once, mm -hmm. and we have to use them every single time. <coughs> and so I was against using them because of that reason. I was worried that sometimes if we can, say, induce consciousness, that could we induce a gag reflex? Like, are we causing people to vomit because we're doing such good compressions and I've got this adjunct in their, in their tongue? And so I was against it. I didn't want to use it. Do you think you could run a marathon faster with two NPAs in your nose? You know? Like... Maybe I just use it when I need it. And so that was the approach. But I went totally against that. And then here I am on a code, not using the OPAs because I'm against them. And I couldn't ventilate the patient, so I moved over to get set up to intubate. And an EMT slid in, threw an OPA in, and then got fantastic ventilations. And so I was burning myself with that thought. So I, I absolutely still use these adjuncts. But I just don't have this, this method. We all have different airway profiles. And so I think we need to respect the individual. And uh, I, I basically walk up. The one thing that's true is I go up and I just pull the airway open. And I start with just just a one breath that's just with nothing. And then I start going from there. And I think that's really important. So, yeah, yeah I think that's a great way to approach it. Well, awesome. Yeah. Let's get started. Cool. All, All right. right. Where are we, uh, we going to start out with this? Um, I start with, uh, like, I go back to this, like, I used to play uh, football, mm -hmm. and <laughs> I had this coach that taught us how to catch our football correctly. You need you need to use the right hands. So, like, you put your window of opportunity is what they call it. So uh -huh. you just have your finger and your thumbs touch. And that's how you're supposed to catch most footballs above your waist and then below your waist, just your pinkies touch. But anyways, a good hands, transfer. So when you take catch the ball, you want to transfer it to the side, like a sideline side. And then this last thing he made us do was confirm our catch. And you'd have to actually physically, he want to see your helmet go down and watch the ball go tucked into your side. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't do those three things, he'd make you run a lap. And so that was how I started this class was like that same idea. Like for 100 balls I catch in a practice, good hands, correct transfer, confirm. Uh, you can apply that to a ventilation. And so to start, we want to have a good hands technique. Now, how are you guys ventilating patients typically? Um, I mean, the stuff that's out there you hear a lot about is CE for when Correct. someone's doing a, a single person uh, technique. And there was a term that you used a minute ago about a mandible. Yeah. Um, the one thing that, you know, we teach a lot in our department is pulling the mandible into the mask. That's really, really important. Yeah. And um, life light? Is it CE technique? Two person technique. You guys are doing two person? Okay. Um I feel like it's becoming more and more prevalent to ventilate two person. I'm hearing it more in like the pre hospital and the podcaster th things. Um, I think they're doing it in EDs as well. Is that what you're seeing? Mm -hmm. um, so the mandible to the mask is what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I will say pre hospitally, sometimes we're still resource deficient. Correct. And so it can be 
difficult to do a two-person TE technique, which I'll discuss in further, but essentially, like, this is where my class really started, was just focusing on good airway technique. Now, with the CE technique, it's, it's a very effective way of ventilating a patient, but the problem in the pre-hospital setting is most of our patients are laying on the ground. They're not on a table that you can adjust the volume and you can put your elbow in such a way where you can, say, pull the face or the mandible up into the mask. And so for us, typically what we end up doing is we'll be all of our body weight is above the patient. And then we put the CE technique, which is making a C on the mask and using an E to pull the face up into the mask. What we end up doing is we push down on the face and just focus more on getting a good seal. And that can be really damaging to patients. And so I think there's more blanket training that's saying that we should bag two person use the TE technique, which for this is this is a thought I had trying to teach this audio. It's, it's a very visual. But if you guys were to grab behind grab your ears, that's the kind of technique that you would grab with a patient. So for any of your listeners, if you were to just grab behind your ears, you can dig your middle fingers into your jaw. There's a little 90 degree angle that goes up behind your ear. It's about an inch. And you can grab onto that. It's the condyler process. And you use your hands to pull that up. And then the TE is representing the thenar eminence, which is the biggest meat of the palm of your hand that's by your thumb. Uh, you use this to like determine like how rare you'd want to cook your steak for mm -hmm. anyone that's listening. Heard about that, yeah. yeah. You, that's the te the thenar eminence, and you're using that to get a seal around the patient and pull the face into the mask. And so I think a big problem is that in the pre-hospital setting, this is how we were taught whenever we started practicing in the field these techniques from what was being done in the OR. But ergonomically, we're just not in the same situation that they are. And so without any really checks and balances to confirm that we're really successful in our ventilations, we've just been sending a lot of volume into the wrong places or not into the lungs. And so that's, that's a big problem. And so uh, a good technique is pulling the face into the mask. And there are still times I use a one-person technique. It's if we are resource deficient or if the patient has a really complementary airway to do that. Uh, I sometimes still do that, but I'm definitely ventilating with a process but it is pulling that face up into the mask. The other thing is uh, having a good seal. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like that term seal, get a good seal. A uh, good seal, uh, well, first off, if you were to ventilate using the CE technique, which I know all of you have, if you are detecting leaking on, say, the side that your hand isn't, what is the move to address that issue? Just move. <clears throat> try to move the bag to that side so you're kind of putting and pressure and you put pressure and so if you are feeling pressure you probably have a problem pressure's problem right and so if your duck is quacking have you ever heard a duck quack <laughs> have you ever heard a bag <laughs> quack right yeah. uh, if you can hear that pressure pressurized breaths is a problem and so typically how i imagine it works is well first off if the airway is just open uh it'll move freely in and out of the lungs uh i think atmospheric pressure is 14.7 maybe i'm not good with this science stuff but Hang i on. just remember this just, just to make sure we don't atmospheric pressure is at 300 feet 760 elevation. millimeters of mercury <laughs> And how many? 700 what? 760 millimeters of mercury yeah. or 14.7 PSI. 760 millimeters of mercury. And that's the <coughs> conversion that I wanted for this class because I want it to be relatable. Now, millimeters of mercury is so we take negative three millimeters of mercury of interthoracic pressure is what we make to allow air to rush into our lungs. So we take it from 760 to 757, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you were to think about that from like a positive pressure side, that's how much squeeze a blood pressure of three is all that you should be uh, distributing for that air to move anything beyond that. You probably got problems. And so if you're pulling the face into the mask and the airway's open, it should move in freely. 
And I remember it was so contrasting, like when you bagged the stomach until you intubated and then you give your first breath and you're in and it's just like so smooth. I called it like a butter breath. It feels just like so magical. And you should have that when you're ventilating through a mask. So the airway should be open. So pressure's problems. If you're putting pressure on the oropharynx, getting a good seal, what you'll feel is because there's so much resistance, it wants to come back out the mask. And now it's trying to exit out the side that you're not getting a good seal. So you're detecting seal issues. So then you push down harder on the side that your hand isn't. Now you've completed your seal And now that volume really has nowhere to go. And so you're either just ineffectively in the lungs or just outright in the stomach. And that's all a problem. And so just you should address that issue. Yeah. And so I I use the word, so instead of get a good seal and ventilate the patient, which you'll hear in training all the time, I'm more about pulling the face into the mask and getting a light seal. And so if it's a light seal, you might have seal issues. You just won't ever detect it because you're just going freely into the lungs. So, yeah. Awesome. Dang. That's great. And a way to help you go freely into the lungs is using oral adjuncts and having a good positioning. Good positioning is absolute. And then um, just like in the OR setting, I like to open my airway, face into the mask, whatever technique works best for the situation that I'm in, and then I deliver volume. I'm looking for, I'll, I'll walk you guys through my confirmation ventilation process. But uh, if I'm having issues, if I'm having pressure, and I'm trying to do everything right, that's when I start incorporating adjuncts to get there. And if I still can't do that, then I'm thinking upgrading. And so just walking through that process. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, great question. Anything? Are you going to walk us through the process? <laughs> Love doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> I uh, I have taught, I've got a couple thousand hours teaching this class. I, I've done it in a really intimate setting where I go teach an individual crew. We have almost 30 stations, so we go to that same station three days in a row. Um, I don't have an acronym. Do you guys like acronyms? Yeah. Every, Honestly, I love Should we come up with one right now? <laughs> <laughs> we could definitely make you one. You guys can come the up with one. The six Bs was pretty bad. That was pretty six good. Six Bs was good. Six Bs, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I've always felt overwhelmed with acronyms, so I've like... I've rebelled against it, but yeah. you guys are welcome to create your own acronym. I don't have one, but okay. in the confirmational ventilation process, so if I pull the airway o- o- it open by pulling the face into the mask using a TE technique or a C technique or whatever, whatever is going to work for the specific patient, um, I'm now wanting to transfer. And that's that second portion. And so transferring is that exactly what I just discussed with you guys in that the breath should just go in nice and easy. All right. And that's the first confirmation that I use in that good hands transfer confirmation. And so with confirmation, um, there's, um, I was trying to think of, since I use end title um, as, a, as a way to ventilate a patient, which we'll discuss in a minute, um, I had realized that when we use end title for documentation purposes, it's something that's a, that's a confirmation that we use to confirm that we've successfully intubated a patient. Correct. Well, there's other confirmations that we use to say successfully intubate a patient from a documentation standpoint. And I've been using that now in the process of just ventilating through a mask. And so these are five like d- confirmations that I use uh, to confirm I've successfully ventilated a patient. And it's not an acronym. It's just in a chronological order. This is what I've landed on. But it's easy rise, fall fog, waves again. And I, the six one D again is just a reminder that you got to do this all over again. Easy rise, fall fog, waves again. And so easy is the first thing that happens. And it's every time I squeeze the bag, whether it's through a mask, an eye gel, a king, a combi tube, an uh, um, ET tube, or crike, did the breath go in easy? Chest rise and fall, right? So easy, chest rise is the second confirmation. I let off of the bag, the chest should fall. If the chest falls, where'd that volume go? It should go through the mask, the tube, the eye gel. And then if it fogs, did it collect and tidal waveforms? And then I just do it all over again. Easy rise, fall, fog, waves again. 
and I will talk more about some cases and some stuff, and I constantly walk through my process. So you'll hear me say this all over and over again. Um, for your listeners or for you guys, you may already have your own process, um, but this is mine. And, um, and so it is, you know, from here, this little spot to Good Sam, that's a 12-minute, res- like, probably transport, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. So 200 breaths, maybe. I'm going to win each and every one of those breaths. I'm going to do this again. I remind myself that this person has been breathing on their own since they were born, and now they're not, and it's my job, and it's been called upon me to be their breath. And so I want to win each and every one of those breaths. And I remember, culturally, there was a time when it was the easiest job. It's the job the PIC could do, and, like, order what protocol or what med we're going to give next and be thinking higher other things and remember, oh, yeah, I'll just squeeze the breath. And so this is the one time in emergency services where you can truly celebrate tunnel vision. I'm going to focus inward. I'm not a part of this call anymore. I'm just going to be their lungs. I'm going to go through a process, and I'm going to win the breath. And um, just to go on another little tangent, <laughs> the, um, the BLS to the ALS, like the, really the only difference in our scope, at least in Oregon and probably everywhere, is that we can, the, the paramedics can crike, intubate, and nasally suction. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, two of those things I've never done. And uh, and then one I've done enough, but the rest of it's all pretty much on the table for everyone else that provides service. And so, um, own your airway, mm-hmm. don't manage it. And so, we hear airway management all the time. Part of the class that I've had is just airway ownership, and we're just gonna I love that. We're gonna come in here. I'm gonna apply a process, and I'm gonna try and win those 200 breaths that we have for or whatever happened in this area as we transport to Good Sam, deliver to transfer our care to the hospital. So so that's confirmation ventilation. And then the last thing is that uh, end title, which is, I mean, this is the meat of, of my class, which is looking at capnography. Now, how do you guys use capnography? How do you, how do you teach a probie how capnography works? Right, it's day one for them. First off is I don't teach this class. <laughs> 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 um, we've got a couple pretty stellar instructors on capnography. I'm trying to think of what they do. Um, I've, I've seen them, you know, attach the end title to themselves and walk people through what's happening, what's happening, different types of ventilation. Yeah. Um, if we were to, if we were to do a protocol review, I feel like end title is it needs to be used a little differently on scenes. And so it's more just kind of like impressive bar talk is how we use it. Like we can explain what the normal range is, what we do when it's high, what we do when it's low, what a traumatic brain injury means for it. And then um, what a shark fin looks like. And if you can cover those five, you can get by as being considered like, they have the perception of being a great medic. Yeah, it's like the same when we would say free radicals or yeah. nitrogen wash, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> things I don't understand at all. Yeah. But if I say them, yeah, I I am good at them. Then yeah. you know what I mean. Just regurgitating. So, yeah, and so, but end title is is absolutely wonderful, vital, and uh, and I've learned so much about it in that process of being ventilated and using it to confirm successful ventilations. But at that physiological level, and I will say for like today's talk. Um, I have no focus on metabolic emergencies. So there's no curveballs here. I'm going to talk about cardiac arrest and how we can use end title uh, for patients that maybe suffered a cardiac event and what you might expect to see in the end title at that phase. And so, um, but what end title is measuring is CO2, and it's the process of metabolism. And so, at the cellular level, all the way down to the like single cell, if it's, if it's going through the process of metabolism, just think of your body as a house that's on fire. And so if your house is on fire, the fire is the actual metabolism. So if we eat food and we store that energy and eventually we use it, the byproduct of that fuel in that house fire is the smoke, the CO2. That CO2 is going to travel up your circulatory system 
It'll meet up with your capillary alveolar. I call those drug dealers, and they're going to have a gas exchange. It's kind of like, hey, man, I got some CO2. What you got, right? <laughs> O2. Yeah. All right. Exchange happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we've got O2, and say in cardiac arrest, it's now being circulated if we're doing compressions, and then the CO2 is exhausted on our ventilations. Now, conscious and breathing, us all right now, here, this is just a normal process, and our primary method for getting rid of that byproduct, that CO2, is by breathing, the process of respiration. And so maybe you guys are already doing this, but you can use and title to measure a successful ventilation through a mask. And so for the last few years, I've been trying to incentivize with our district or our fire department to use it at first breath because in a way, if you see CO2 coming out, so when they exhaust the CO2, there's a little tube that's collecting that. It's called, it's aspirating the volume from your respiratory and it's called side stream monitoring in the monitor. The monitor can only see this, the bound chemicals. So it can't see nitrogen or oxygen but it can see the CO2. And so it catches it in these little sensors and it will display how much CO2 is seeing, is being, is, is, is there. And so we'll see this like deflection, this waveform that comes up and then when we give the next breath, it would come back down because it can't see any oxygen, but it can see the CO2. And so by plugging this in, pulling the airway open, easy rise, fall, fog, waves, I am able to see CO2 come out, which means that O2 went in. Now, I don't know how much O2 went in, and in a little bit of time, we might be able to see that in the SpO2, but it would start with the CO2 out, knowing O2 went in. And so to plug it in, the incentive for all of your listeners to get this plugged in by first breath, by uh, delivering your volume, and plugging in into title, by seeing the CO2 coming out, that means O2 went in. And so to have that envision being in a fork in the road, by plugging it in, you're seeing that you might be making things better because O2 is going in and you're circulating it compared to not plugging it in and just not knowing. Mm -hmm. but was I in the stomach or not? You don't know. Were you just not effective in getting in the lungs? And it's just... You have an eye gel in, it's just Xing out the mask and you can't even detect that. It's just coming right out their mouth, right? Versus plugging it in and knowing. And so I think there's an incentive there. You know, I review all of these cases on the back end. And for a while, I think it was like, please plug it in because I want to review it. It's like, no, plug it in because you might be in chance, increasing your chances of ROSC and even better survivability. Mm -hmm. So both wins because we don't want to work 30-minute codes. We want to get ROSC as quickly as possible, but... Most importantly, we want to get, you know, Neurologically people. Neurologically intact people that's that are right. coming to the station to say thank yeah. you. Yeah. And so um, I was very lucky to do one of my big training stints at a time when we were updating our kits. And so one of the individuals that was championing these new kits we got had the idea, which I loved, of having our end title on our bags. So we pull them out of the packaging and we have it just sitting on the bag with the mask on. So makes it for our crews that they just see it all set up so they plug it in yep. so we've got a lot of consistency getting and title plugged in so yeah but my challenge to uh, maybe all of your listeners currently our district uh, is to plug it in uh, at first breath and so just because you awesome. get so much information yeah. yeah love it so what has been i can imagine because i've been the guy that goes around the department teaches something new and I have very particular faces in my brain <laughs> when I go teach something and I'm going, okay, this person's going to be a challenge for this reason. These people are going to be super, super easy. They're going to grab it quickly and run with it. What are, what are, what have those conversations been like when you're taking this around your department? Well received. Good. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it's because I went through that process of letting them, ventilate me don't do that yeah but, <laughs> but that that really won, won over some hearts and minds um i will say uh you could if you were trying to win people over you could have people pull your airway open it's painful um it's behind the ears a nerve sensitive 
It's a great nerve, though. It does stimulate respiratory drive, so it's great, good on opiate overdoses. Um, even just patients that are conscious, hypoxic, that gets them breathing better, opens their airway. But um, that's a way to win is when you when you go through those reps and let people see that you know you care enough that you're willing to um, sacrifice a little pain. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how I want a lot of people over initially. Um, now I just now I have all this case case data, and that's another hard thing is you know I tried really hard not to come at like why didn't you plug in end title on this? I've been talking yeah. about this for a while. It's more just trying to understand the the crew. I always assume good intent with with the line personnel, and um, doing that I think has helped get some buy in that people can trust that I'm not just going to immediately go put them in situations where they might have to defend their decisions or their chart or whatever it is that they're they're mm -hmm. going through. Um, and then the last thing, like you have to, I think, s put your ego aside and really focus on teaching it as s simple as you can, and it's not trying to high brain or show you how, how well you understand it, but um, explaining it at the basic level, I think really invites paramedics to just kind of listen and they may just confirm and agree with what you're saying, but I think sometimes they're getting it too a little bit, some of the concepts or at least that physiology. And so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. That's a good question. Um, yeah. <coughs> so add some. Yeah, what do you got? I have a question too. Go ahead first. <laughs> Sorry. Why? I don't know oh, where you it forgot is. What it it's was? gone. Oh. oh, oh, you're saying um, you forgot. Your this question. might not be the appropriate time to ask, but how do you feel about peep? Oh man, I love peep. Oh yeah, right. we of course all you do. do. We're yeah, pro we all do. Here. Okay, we're pro peep. Five minimum, everybody. Um, and what we learned doing cadaver labs is that a lot of departments don't even have peep valves. Right. So okay, let's do this for a second. Maybe longer. Yeah. There's stuff I'll talk about, about the physiology of end tidal and the cardiac arrest phase. It's fantastic. I mean, that's the new stuff that I got to roll out to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought about this a lot. And in cardiac arrest, we're measuring our ventilations and capnography. It's measuring our quality of ventilation as well as our ability to perfuse. And so a lot of times people are worried about interthoracic pressure. But how do you measure that? How do you measure interthoracic pressure? How can you determine? Because I'm pushing chest rise and fall, and they're saying, don't do that because that's going to put too much pressure on the heart on preload. And, mm -hmm. right? But how could we measure our output end title, right? Mm -hmm. And so what if... We're getting good, consistent end tidal greater than 50. Could we put PEEP on at that point? Right? What if we just continued to add PEEP until we started to see the end tidal drop? You see what I'm saying? I do. Because you're not, never com about this you're never, you're not compromising your preload if you're getting great circulation. I'd love it if we got there at some point. Mm -hmm. But that's like a whole nother like, yeah. bag wow. of worms, right? Right. But maybe uh, let me talk about how to measure end tidal in cardiac arrest. And then this talk that we're having here might make more sense. But what were you thinking? Um, I, th I think the same thing. If, if I'm alive and I have about five of PEEP because I'm alive, but then I die, I should still be entitled to my five of PEEP. <laughs> That's so you good. Know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, because you're dead now, and now we're mechanically ventilating... Um, if I'm perfusing well, or if I'm not perfusing well, maybe I need support in my lungs because I haven't been breathing now for a few minutes or maybe seconds or who knows how long I've been down. Yeah. Atelectasis occurs pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So why can't I have my peep back? Just because I'm dead doesn't mean I don't get peep. <laughs> Give me my peep. Give me my peep. So that's I what I that. think. I think the zero peep, um... Who's out there the, championing zero the Zeep, peep? Oh, Everybody's that's a champion championing oh, for zero cardiac peep. arrest. For cardiac arrest. Um because well, it could decrease preload. Yeah. Because it could yeah, because yeah, it it could prevent the venous flow from coming back to the heart. That's what people are thinking. It could be that we're trained to the lowest common denominator, which is zero peep might be safer yeah. for across the board. Right. But I disagree. Hundred percent. Huh. I've, I've never heard this argument before. This so when you have a cardiac arrest, do you, you still do peep? Absolutely. 
five every time. Remember we had this conversation and we never figured out why we don't have peep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see the science behind it where if you increase your intrathoracic pressure, pressure too much, the venous return can't come back to the heart and therefore you don't have any right. outflow. But I get should, it. You should see that in the end title. However, you should is, see that in the end title. And yeah. I get that sometimes in cardiac arrest, you have very low end title, so it's hard to gauge because you don't have a lot of circulation yet Yeah. until you're doing good CPR and your end title comes up a little bit. But at the same time, um, I, I really think you're compromising your ventilations to yeah. get that oxygen exchange to once you start getting that circulation flow. I think it's bad, bad news bears. But we have a video I'll include in the show notes. That we recorded, Dan and I, Sorry. maybe five years ago, where we have a pig lung. Oh yeah, and we're showing what Peep is actually doing it's when you so deliver great. ventilations. Right. It is, and it's substantial what it's doing. It's not just like people. The thing that I've heard most often from folks who I'm teaching anything Peep related to is that, oh yeah, it stents open the alveoli, and it's like okay, but that's like the start of what it's doing. It's actually holding it open and it's building on that progress you're making mm -hmm. so that you can have a much easier time ventilating and get that exchange. Yeah, and <coughs> it increases me, the surface area you have for yes. that oxygen exchange. And Dan, you say something in the video and I'm trying to remember what it is. You're basically like talking about the winds you're getting as you go up with PEEP with each ventilation to the certain point that you've set the dial at. But if you st if you took peep off at that point, mm -hmm. you can see how much you lose so quickly. So quickly, and it takes a while to build that that win back up. Yep. Um, I always thought I, I literally have that video in the back of my brain when we have someone yeah. that we're managing their airway on because I'm in, I'm envisioning the person who's laying in front of me and their lungs, and I'm saying, okay, this person, it, it's all atelectasis at this point until I get in there and start making a difference for whatever they've got going on. And if I'm being honest right now, I'm a, like my 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 crew is a proby factory. So I'm not doing much of any of this other than just <laughs> managing other people doing this, you know. Right. Yeah. Um but it's it's watching what they're doing and then throwing in these kind of nuggets of information to keep them, you know, thinking about these things rather than just going through. A, and it's a, hard a because some sometimes we get really spoiled because um, we have ventilators and we have pressure that we can measure or volume we can measure depending on what mode you're in. And so that that makes it a little bit easier to accept like, oh, five to 10 of PEEP is great. It's not doing anything harmful. Um, but there are, mul you know, I mean, you can't just blanket say that. So I no. do feel like maybe that's where the zero PEEP came from is just and Is deciding. it evidence based? It is. Zero PEEP and how much evidence? I think it has to do with the, some of the studies on interthoracic pressure. Yeah. But... But like can't I, we augment that through pressors and fluid? And I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I don't. Th I, I think that's again like putting a band aid on the the problem. But if you have good end tidal and good circulation because you're doing good CPR, you should have. I think that's a f deep. fantastic way of m measuring perfusion, which we can discuss. Um, that's like the next portion of this of this uh, of my at least the class I've been teaching. Uh, and I've been teaching it a lot. I just got back on the line on Monday. I taught the class 140 times. So I That's amazing. <laughs> and it's just Dang, like, dude. Yeah. That's yeah. Impressive. So he he came and he taught our class. Uh huh. And he texted, me, he texted me that day. By the way, yeah. <laughs> he's like, dude, we got to we got to get Bruce on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> it's he, all my first my first PowerPoint was stuff I taught years ago. I'm all shaky. I'm clunky all over the place, and then I got them through, what we've gotten through so far, opening the airway, and transferring, confirmation, ventilations, and then I and then I hit the second port, and I just, yeah, everything was, felt really good. Oh, it yeah. was great. I mean, the people still say, well, Bruce says this, Bruce says yeah. this, <laughs> and so That's you're awesome. making an impact That's at great. the lowest That's awesome. level. That's great. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Okay, uh, so sorry to derail. Yes. No, anyway, I love that. I phase two of I've the been program. I've thinking about that peep thing for a long time. Me too, um, obviously. <laughs> uh, just on that real quick, uh, drug dealers. I'll talk about drug dealers a little bit more, but the, the base of your lungs is where you're enriched with the capillaries and alveoli. That's where it's plentiful, and that's where you want to be 
at the apex, the top of your lungs, which is where we ventilate a lot when we're too scared to, that might be in the stomach, we just get these lesser breaths, you're only really accessing half of that exchange uh, and half of those lungs. And so it's not, you know, so when we're talking about this peep, like you're saying, like you're, you're at the base, chest rise and fall, you're, you're maximizing your drug dealers. You're making things better for this person. So that's so important. That's great. Um, all right. So I'll segue to this next question. Have you guys, Steve and I started, Steve got his medic in like 08? Uh, oh, wait. Yep. And then I remember Steve and I were at a, we were sleepers, volunteers together. And he whiteboarded what, what the program's going to be like. Cause I went in two years later, but anyways, um, still a big lover of the whiteboard <laughs> when, in general, when we first started, we used antitidal to confirm successful intubations mm -hmm. and it started color metric pre-hospitally. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yellow is golden. Purple is poopy. <laughs> Purple is poopy, yep. yellow is gold. Yeah. Yep. And then we move from that to the inline uh, and title and nasal cannula, and we can measure that. And we were using that also to document successful intubations. Um, what is, have you guys experienced since you started your career at this progression of end title? Have you seen higher values? Oh, of yes. Lately? Higher numbers or higher... Numbers. Capnometry. During cardiac arrest, During right? Car oh, in cardiac yes. arrest. Let's focus yes. on cardiac arrest. What is a high value you see? This is not something that we all know that I'd well. I'd say like right? 20. Oh, highest value you've ever seen. Oh, ever? Ever. During cardiac arrest. During cardiac arrest. Fifth. I don't feel like I see a lot of high numbers. I feel like I see a lot of low numbers. And I think that's just due to... We often are not there right after they've gone down. I think this is more of a... I, I feel with how CPR has been just just burned into our brains, and then you get some of these, these EMT basics that just, within our department, that just, yeah. they own that chest. And those, those values are significantly high. Dan, Dan and I had this conversation before, but I'll ask you... Uh, we ask it because we use end title so frequently on almost every code that we run. And I've been reviewing cases for the last five years. One thing that I found very profound was how high end title values are. During CPR? During cardiac arrest, okay. yeah. And, uh, and so I, I ask this question to the class, uh, trying to get people. I get met with these responses where people don't really have an answer because it's not really vital that we track all that well. And so in reviewing two, 300 cardiac arrest cases in the last five or six years, that's one thing that really was like an existential question that I've been looking at. Like, why? Why are we seeing such higher values? 90s. It caps at 100 uh, on the life packs. I don't know what the Zoll caps out at, but... Couldn't tell you. Um, it's kind of weird because it's just like this flat line that goes across your monitor. It's saying, I'm done. And when I was asking this question, I was met with people that, like, I've seen 100, I've seen 90s. I had this, like, chart on the board where you could choose, like, what category you sit in, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, one individual told me that they saw one at 110 at arrival at the ED when they plugged into their monitor at the hospital, and it was at 110. So, again, this has just been, like, this question that I have had for a few years is why. And are you talking about end titles through the mask? All of it. Specifically? Okay. You're not yep. talking about, because the only end titles I'm talking about are ones that we've, we've worked them for a few, a few minutes and then we put it on when we do our innovations because we're not currently doing end title through mm -hmm. a mask. And we had a, at least in the Portland metro area, our, our district specifically because we were plugging end title in so frequently and we would have, we would call MRH to discontinue, but our end title was 76. Mm -hmm. And so uh, yeah. we just wanted to stop, but that vital was weird. And so then the MRH or the people that you would call for guidance just said transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just transport because that's way too high. And so there was uh, not complaints, but there was questions as to why that's happening so frequently with us compared to, say, another similar size department that only plugs it in in a systole uh, once they've upgraded the airway, and yep. that was only to con just discontinue per protocol. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even really seeing it like we were. But yeah. we, were, we had to we had to address that issue because yeah. we were everybody was going all of a sudden, and that was 
really bothering everyone, you know. <laughs> yeah. well, and title's a function of perfusion, so you must be doing a lot of really yeah. good CPR mm-hmm. yeah. to perfuse enough to be moving guys? that much blood through the lungs to exchange that type right. of and CO2. So this, this, aside from it being content caused from a metabolic emergency, um, this has been the question, is why? Why are we suddenly seeing higher end tidal values of, say, lately, of the last five years? Could you guys take a stab at that? Here's one option. It could be this. It could be that we as a human species has evolved in a way where we now progressively off-gas CO2 in our process of death. Oh, are we in just a drinking more, more carbonated beverages? Yeah. In there a you more, go. It's all the LaCroix. Yeah. Yeah. It's in a, in a more environmentally <laughs> friendly <laughs> way. Yeah. You know, we're being good to the planet. Yeah. It well, could be that. It. No, okay. Or it could be something else, right? Uh, emphasis on CPR would be my best guess. All and right. And the yeah. implementation of uh, automatic CPR devices and things like mm-hmm. that. Maybe better bystander p- CPR as yeah. well mm-hmm. before you yeah. get there. Better. Yeah. This is the word I look for when I teach the class. Better, right? Maybe everything's just getting better, right? Bystander CPR, emphasis on CPR. Like we, it's non-negotiable time off the chest. We have KPIs, key performance indicators that measure how successful we are on timed benchmarks to giving CPR. When did you implement your Lucas devices? Pretty recent, in the last few years. Yeah, three or four years ago. We used to... um, Dan was probably a part of this, probably championed this, like, at our dual houses. We would go on cardiac arrest. We were only allowed to send a single resource to those. So they would sneak the second unit out. We called it ghosting. Mm-hmm. And that Explain w- to people what a dual house is. Just two for those who don't know. engine companies, a uh, truck and an engine is typically the complement. So that's, for us, that's eight, eight personnel. For years, they used to do that. When I got hired, they they changed the policy to go take on a more popular pit crew approach, yep. which and a lot of people are doing. Where our minimum now is six police mm-hmm. are trained. Everything's getting better. Mm-hmm. The eye gels better. The way that we give meds is easier and better. The um, eye gels are better. They don't have any bulbs to inflate, and our EMTs yep. are proficient at putting them. And so, but are we doing that? I know the gold standard is still the ET tube, and we are off that airway off those ventilations for quite a while. Even with those eight people there, we're still not doing as good as we could be doing. We're doing great CPR, but the ventilations are not as good as they could be. That's, well, that's my, that's the whole goal and mission is to, um, is is to address both needs. Um, Everything is getting better and end title is merely reflecting that. That's all it is. And so I've been reviewing a lot of cases. And so I show a case and I show end title at like 90. And I kind of explain what it is that we're looking at on these rhythms. I show impedance. Have you guys heard of impedance? It measures chest yeah. wall movement. You can see heartbeats. You can see breaths. You can see uh, chest compressions and the quality of those kind of. Um, and then it shows like pulse oximetry. It shows a paddles view. And uh, in the case that I was showing, this patient had end title in the 90s. Um, I, I explain what a waveform is, and I'm guessing your listeners have a general understanding of, of what antitidal waveforms look like. Um, but that's it. So if we go on a patient that's in cardiac arrest from ca- a cardiac event, at some point, they'll be in respiratory arrest. They've mm-hmm. been drowning in underwater. And so we need to address both both of these arrests and we're really good at the chest and shocking and giving pressors and all of that stuff but sometimes we just never address the respiratory arrest that's there mm-hmm. so when you shock a patient out of v-fib into asystole you fix the heart they're in arrest still we've got to address the airway as well and be really efficient in that and so i always think about that and i love sitting around a table like we are right now and arguing the, the chest compression versus airway, like which one's more important? What do you think most people tell you? Compressions over Compressions. Right? What if I said it's just a dumb argument and we shouldn't have it? Like it's non-negotiable that we're going to do chest compressions and we're never going to negotiate time off the chest. But that doesn't mean we can just be substandard on the airway. Mm-hmm. We should be opening that up and ventilating with a process as quickly as humanly possible. As humanly as possible. And not putting yeah. your your intern or the person with the least amount of experience doing that. And that's what we do. 
Right. That's what we do all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, for, especially for airway procedures. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that, uh, and it's ingrained in what we do with probation with with their, you know, one year on the line. Right. We have to make sure they know how to do this stuff, and we have to make sure that they are proficient in managing an airway, proficient in doing a procedure. I mean, it's it's baked into what we do. Yes. And so it would be quite the, and I'm not saying I'm against it at all. But it would be quite the change to say, what, we're not going to, you know, we're going to put the person with the most years of experience in the most airway. Well, uh, Or empower everyone to be yeah. the best person to be right. on the airway, yeah. whether yeah. it's the six-month probie or the 13-year medic. Yeah. We everyone want. should be at the same standard for that particular skill, yes. yeah. which is the most important skill Easily. in the back of the ambulance, mm-hmm. in the on-scene, wherever oh, yeah. you're at. And I can say from my experience, when I have someone fresh on the line and we're working through getting them their standing orders, and for us, standing order is just because you have a paramedic cert doesn't mean you get to show up and run paramedic level calls at our department. We have a process to put you through and make sure that you're proficient. And when we have someone on an airway, we, you know, we get that call where someone gets to innovate. My ability to run the call or to supervise the call in any way, shape, or form goes out the window because I'm staring at that kid doing the airway right. every single time. Right. And it's like, better not mess this up. Like, because we, there's yeah. so much writing on it. And, you know, the, th- the one thing I always have in the back of my brain is hyperventilation. That's huge. Um, and not doing that unless it's absolutely called for, which we can get into why or when that would be. But of course, um, it's, it's really, really important. To make sure that they don't, you know, we've gotten two steps forward. We don't want to go one right. or two steps mm-hmm. back now, you know, with a crappy airway management. And airway management is ventilating. Yes. Air in, <clears throat> CO2 out. And it could be BBM. That could right. be your highest form of ventilation if it's going well. Yes. It doesn't always have to be intubation or gel or anything. It could and just. That's a hard one, right? It's so hard. I mean, 15 years ago, I pull off. I remember pulling off. This right a block away from the hospital to get that tube because I don't want to walk into that ER without a tube. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a yeah. pride thing. Yeah. And if and you have a failed airway, like you, you do intubate, but it's it's a failed intubation, your backup could just be BVM. Mm-hmm. If it was effective before, it'll be effective again. Mm-hmm. You don't have to move to the next yeah. highest thing. It can. If uh, you if you bag with a process mm-hmm. and you're using Entitled to confirm kind of where you're at, um, what I have found is that when I'm effective, everything slows down. Mm-hmm. And so if it's an RSI and I'm able to control the airway and get the SATs up by using correct airway opening techniques, man, everything gets so calm and chill. And we have a wonderful, like, I mean, it's I know it's a pretty grave time for this individual. Right. But we're having an experience that's running smoothly. Mm-hmm. And when those go, sm- I mean, we know when it's not. It's the worst. Mm-hmm. It's just like it's hard to think stress filled you feel weight Mm -hmm. and so and that applies with uh using a good hands technique is if you if you're on a cardiac arrest and you pull the airway as an emt you pull the airway open and it's effective like i i can't stress this enough you're gonna now do this for a long time because it's working and your forearms and hands get really tired and so i end up having to swap out i can do about a four minute hold before I have to swap with someone, and we we've gotten to where we're doing that now, and it's there's nothing better than than you know someone that's been through the class approach and like man my hands were <laughs> getting so tired <laughs> I actually had to swap people out and so um, yeah if you hold an airway open for 16 straight minutes that you might be doing something wrong you yeah. know because it really does get taxing um, there's some little tricks you can do like get your knees really close and get into like a child's pose almost where you could hold it longer but ultimately yeah that's that's a big deal. You'll do things longer when it, when you win it. Sometimes you do it too good, and then you don't. Now you have to RSI a cardiac arrest that you got Rosk on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wish you yeah. got the airway established. But I've had crews that say, "Hey, we just we just continued to bag them to the hospital." You know, and they were winning. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Bruce has definitely given us a lot to think about, and he's going to have a lot more, which is why we're breaking up this episode into two parts. So join us next week, and we'll launch part two of our series with Bruce talking about uh, effective ventilations and how we can maximize each one. Thanks so much for joining us. Catch you on the next one.